everyone's talking about it. There are many opinions. There is much debate. Some businesses and churches have reopened, but what really needs to be reopened is us. It's time. Now more than ever. To see light through the cracks. To see hope shine through. To hear a voice speaking to you. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. The door isn't locked. The way has been made. Fear is not our guide. Jesus is the key. Well, we've been saying it for weeks now. Perhaps you've even said it yourself. I just can't wait until things get back to normal. <laughs> haven't you said that? Or haven't you said that? But, but I have a thought for us today. Normal wasn't working. Normal wasn't working. Now, most of us would agree with that. Most of us would agree, even before COVID-19, what was considered normal wasn't working. So as a result, people talk about a new normal. We hear things like, what will the new normal look like? Now, when people talk about a new normal, they're normally talking about a new normal as it relates to society and the way we interact with one another or a new normal as it relates to schools and how they will open and what that will look like or maybe sports and will there be a sports league and, and how all that will play out. But today, I want to challenge you when you think about a new normal, I want to challenge you to think about a new normal as it relates to you. Because again, if we're honest, most of us would have to agree that even back in February, can you remember back that far? <laughs> Doesn't that seem like three years ago, by the way, right? I mean, just a few months ago, if you would think back to February, most of us, normal was stress and worry and conflict. Normal for most people were living such busy Wild lives, they were overwhelmed, they were rushed here and there. They, they never felt like they had enough time to get everything done. Normal for most people in America meant debt where they couldn't really even see a way out. Normal for a lot of people in America as it related to their marriage or their relationships that they were so exhausted they... They barely had time for one another. And normally, normal, unfortunately, in America for a lot of people meant hopping from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship until finally settling down, finally getting married, and then seven years into that, there being a problem. And normal for almost half of Americans meant divorce. Normal wasn't working. And when we think about families, normal back in February, normal meant there was so much running here and there. The kids were just as stressed out as you were, and you had them in all these things and all these leagues and all these activities. And But actually, we probably spent less and less time with one another. And as it related to faith, Normal for most people as it related to faith is they either rejected God or if they say they really believed in God, they lived as if he didn't exist. In the words of Titus, their actions denied him. Normal wasn't working. So we need a new normal. And for seven weeks, we've been studying this thought of reopening. And I've been challenging us to reopen us. And I want you to open your Bible today to Matthew chapter 7. If you do not have a hard copy of the Word of God, 
Uh, hopefully, you've got a smartphone, a tablet, electronic device. You go ahead and power it up. We have free Wi-Fi at both our campuses. Those of you up at our Highlands campus in Allegheny County, there's free Wi-Fi up there as well. You follow along with us, Matthew chapter 7. Now, if you know anything about the New Testament, you probably know that Matthew chapter 7 is part of Jesus' most famous sermon. Of all the teaching, of all the lessons, of all the sermons that you have heard, if you have grown up in church or you've been part of a church, you probably have heard of the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus was teaching in what was called the Sermon on the Mount is how a true believer should actually think and act. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount shows us how someone who is right with God should behave. And in a word, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is you had to take the entire Sermon on the Mount and funnel it down to one word, the word would be different. Jesus is saying, as one of my children, I want you to think, to act, to behave different than those who aren't my children. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. And now, as always, I'm reading out of the 1984 New International Version of God's Word. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. From the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what would you have them do to you? For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate. And narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What is he saying? Here on your handout there, number one, I hope you've downloaded your message sheets with us. And number one, a true believer thinks differently. A true believer thinks differently. We see the power, the importance of having proper biblically-based thoughts all the time in the Bible. Uh, matter of fact, Proverbs 23, the Proverbs said this way, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The second Corinthians chapter 10 reminds us that we are to take every thought captive. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Verse 8. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, look what he says, think about such things. You see, now more than ever on your handout, we need what's called a biblical world view. We need a biblical world view. Matter of fact, I'm convinced that one of the biggest problems in our world today is that even believers do not truly have 
a biblical world view. Now, what is your world view? Your world view is how you see the world. Your world view, and everyone has a world view. How do you react to the problems in the world? How do you see the issues? How do you see things? Whether you realize it or not, you and I have a world view, a basic belief system. Everybody has a basic belief system about morality, about society, about government, even about faith. Everybody has, you might call it a perspective. Everybody has a perspective on life and how they approach problems and look for solutions and whether they, how they make decisions. Now, before we dive in to the text here in Matthew chapter 7, it dawned on me a lot of people do not understand, A, what is a biblical worldview. You might have heard that term. A biblical worldview. Well, what is it? Number one, it's more than just a set of ideas. And number two on your handout, it starts and ends with the Bible's key teachings. You see, when I have a biblical worldview, I base my life, I base my thoughts, I try to base my actions and my reactions on the teachings of the Bible. What is called the fundamentals of the faith are the basic doctrines the Bible teaches about man, about the Bible, about salvation, about Jesus. Now, you see, a biblical worldview, number three, never distinguishes between the religious and the secular. What's that mean? If I have a biblical worldview, I can't live one way on Sunday while I'm in church and another way Monday through Saturday. You see, most people do not even understand what a biblical worldview does. A biblical worldview, number four, answers the key questions of life. And I put them on your handout. What are the key questions of life? Where did I come from? Because how I answer that question really affects my thoughts. Why am I here? My perspective on that question will directly correlate to my actions. Where did we come from? Why am I here? What is wrong in the world? Everybody agrees that there's something wrong in the world. A biblical worldview affects what I think is wrong with the world, whose fault it is, and how do I fix it? And what is next? And where am I going? See, a biblical worldview believes Jesus is the answer. A biblical worldview believes Jesus is the answer for our day, not education, not communication, not more understanding, not certainly not politics. Jesus is the answer. A biblical worldview sees the issues of the world through the lens of Scripture. Here's the problem. Many believers do not see the issues of our day through the lens of Scripture. How do we know? Well, think about the amount of people in our own country who claim to be believers, but their unchristlike actions maybe prove otherwise. The statistics are frightening, especially among younger people. According to the Barner Group, George Barner survey, Less than one half of one percent, less than one half of one percent of 18 to 24 year olds have a biblical worldview. That's frightening. Now, I'm not just trying to rag on young adults or college age students. No, I believe that generation will change the world. The only question is how? The only question is which way will they change the world? And really, it's not their fault. They're a product. They're a product of a nation that has for years devalued life. They're a product of a nation that has elevated individual rights above righteousness. And they're a product of a nation that for years 
now have all but removed God from school. They're a product of a nation that has, in effect, rewritten history. They're just a product. Now, why do many believers be, why do many believers, not just young adults, why do many believers not or fail to have a biblical world view. Well, I'm convinced, number one, they don't really know what the Bible says. They don't really know what the Bible says. Even people that have grown up in church. Matter of fact, Pastor Joe, our student pastor, was talking to me this week, and he shared one of the things that he's done all through his ministry. As he likes to catch up with seniors who are graduating high school and simply ask them this question. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? And he says it's, it's kind of discouraging in a lot of ways that so many high school seniors, even if they grew up in Sunday school and the youth program and the kids program, cannot give a clear understanding and concise answer to that question. By the way, could you? Let me help you here. What is the gospel? The gospel is that God loves you, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, that's you. The gospel is, though, there's a problem. John 3, I mean, Romans 3, 23, we've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Uh, the gospel is, Romans 6, 23, the result of my sin, the wages of my sin is I'm separated from God. But the gospel is, Jesus came. And 1 Corinthians 15 reminds me, this is the most important thing. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. And the gospel is, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is that God loves you, that you've sinned, there's a punishment for that sin. Jesus came, died, buried, rose from the dead, and you have to confess that and believe that. See, most people don't actually know what the Bible says, so they don't have a biblical worldview. Number two, maybe they know that, but they reject what the Bible says on certain issues. They reject what the Bible says on issues of abortion, or they reject what the Bible says on issues of sexuality, or maybe number three, they've just been influenced by the world. Instead of, the, 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 they're, they're becoming like the world. Number four, they're not totally committed to Christ. What Jesus said, they're like the church in Revelation 3 that was lukewarm. So, as we go back to our text, why is this important? Or number three, what difference does a biblical worldview make? How does a biblical worldview help me to think differently? Well, number one on your handout, it affects how we view other believers. Now, verse 1 and 2 of Matthew 7 is so misunderstood. And I dare say it's one of the top 10 misquoted verses in all the Bible. Even if you don't know anything about the Bible, you've probably heard this verse. You've probably heard it misquoted and taken totally out of context. Let's look at it. Jesus is speaking, do not judge, and that's normally where people end their quote. You know, you're not supposed to judge me. Even the Bible says, do not judge. Don't judge me. The Bible says don't judge. By the way, is that what the Bible says? Let's keep reading. Or you too will be judged. From the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now let me be clear on your handout. This does not prohibit all judging. The context makes this clear. Verse 5, he's just going to say, make sure you do it in the right way. Verse 16 of this same chapter, Jesus is saying, it's one of the ways you'll know who is a real believer and who is a false prophet is by their fruit, 
by their actions, and that certainly implies judging. John 7 verse 24 says, make a proper judgment. It does not mean we're not to judge others. What Jesus is saying here is we're not to judge the motives of another believer because that's God's job. You see, how does a biblical worldview, what difference does it make? It affects how we view other believers. Number two on your handout, it affects how we view ourselves. Now you've probably heard this verse too. Look at it, verse three through five. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Can, can, I, can I give you Kevin's translation here? Okay, not authorized, just Kevin's interpretation, Kevin's translation. Why do you worry about the splinter in, your, in somebody else's eye when you got a two by four in yours? Okay, that's what he's saying here. Okay, and, and then look what he says. How can you say to your brother, a fellow Christian, your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It affects how we view ourselves. It affects our self-image. I've said many times, if you question your identity, you will be defeated by the enemy. We have to view ourselves biblically. We have to realize who we are in Christ, that as a believer, I am a son or daughter of the king. I am a saint. I am a super conqueror. God has created me in his image, and we, listen to this, are more alike than we realize. Matter of fact, in my personal devotions this week, I read something that I hadn't really thought about. And the author in my devotion said this, God has created us 99.5% genetically identical. You and I, genetically speaking, are 99.5% identical. There's only a very small, less than 1%, 0.5% differences that make us unique and those differences are normally in the color of our hair the color of our eyes and of course the color of our skin but for some reason those small differences 0.5 percent seem to create enormous division God has created us in his image now we're not all alike And aren't you glad for that? Amen. I mean, look at the person around you. Aren't you glad you aren't like them? Praise God. Amen. I mean, God loves variety, okay? And the Bible tells us in heaven there will be people from every nation, every language, every tribe, and tongue. But we are, genetically speaking, 99.5% identical. We actually insult God. I believe when we only focus on the 0.5% and ignore the 99.5%, may God help us to have a biblical worldview so how we see other believers and how we see ourselves to be made in his image. You see, number three, it affects how we view other believers. Look at verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. Now, what is he talking about? Can I remind you that in this culture, in Jewish culture, pigs and dogs were despised. Okay, I mean, a a Jew was not to have anything to do with pigs, okay? They weren't like today, we keep, you know, dogs as pets. We have domesticated dogs by and large. In this culture, they didn't do that. Some people, the Lord only knows why, keep pigs as pets, okay? I don't know why anyone would want a pig. By the way, I don't know why anyone would want a cat as a pet either. Come on, you knew it was coming, amen, all right? You knew it was coming, right? I mean, here it is again. Dogs are in the Bible, cats are not. That's all I need to say, all right? 
Don't send me an email trying to tell me that a lion is a cat either. You and I know the difference between a lion and a cat, all right? So look what he's saying here. He's saying, what, is, what does he say? He's saying you just can't help some people. I find it amazing that Jesus didn't do any miracles for unbelievers. It shows me, a biblical worldview shows me how do I handle the gospel in the face of those who hate the truth. And you know what Jesus is teaching us here? He's saying at certain times in certain places, it is no point to cast the pearls of the wisdom of the truth of the gospel into the pig pen of debauchery. It is no reason to do that. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls, your prized possessions to the pigs. Because if you do, they may trample them and then turn don't we see that today? Try to turn the gospel and tear you to pieces. You see, a true believer thinks differently. The, the old normal wasn't working. We have to think differently. Number two, Jesus will say a true believer prays differently. Because let's be honest, for most of us, normal wasn't working. For most of us, we felt like our prayers wouldn't get higher than the ceiling. For most of us, if we were honest, we felt like we were always questioning whether we were praying the right way. We were praying, should I do it this way or that way? We, and the point is, everybody prays. The only question is, to whom do they pray and how often do they pray? And do they pray the way Jesus taught? What is Jesus teaching? Verse 7 Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For anyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, the door will be opened. Let me say, first of all, A, there is a command to pray. We are commanded to pray. 1 Samuel 12, far be it from me that I should sin by failing to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray continually, pray without ceasing. Now, what does Jesus say here? Note, number one, he says, ask. Now, this is in the original what is called the present tense. It means literally on your handout to keep on asking. Keep on asking. It, it speaks of dependence. I'm totally dependent upon you, God, for everything, even my next breath. You know, I've been reminded a lot this week as I've been holding up my new grandson, Liam. And I've been reminded again of that little fella and how he is totally dependent upon others to take care of him. If we actually viewed our Heavenly Father that way, I would probably pray differently. And then look what he says, seek Again, it's in the present tense. Keep on seeking. It speaks of desire. It's not just a one-time thing. That I sought God at a revival. I sought God at a camp. I sought God at VBS. I sought God at the end of a church service. And I got saved and that's it. No, keep on seeking. Keep on growing. Keep on maturing. Do what you're doing today. Keep on taking the next step. Keep on doing it. And then knock. Knock, keep on knocking, it speaks of determination. Now, think about it this way. If you go to somebody's house and you knock on the door, you step back, and what do you do? You wait. What happens if nobody comes to the door? What do you do next? Probably a little louder. And then if nobody comes to the door, at this point there's a divide. Some of us would go, oh well, they must not be home. Others of us would go and we would go. 
we would keep on asking. What have you been praying about? That God's word to you today is keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. Keep on asking. There's a command to pray. And then B, look, there is a confidence when we pray. Verse 8, the door will be opened. That's what he's saying. The door will be opened. We have some incredible promises about prayer in the Bible. John 14, ask and it will be given you. Hebrews, approach the throne of grace with confidence that we might find help in our time of need. But don't misunderstand what Jesus is teaching here. Don't misunderstand. Number one, we don't deserve to get our prayers answered. No, verse 11, he says we are evil. If you then, though you are evil, can I remind you, Romans 3, there's nothing good in us. No one is righteous. No, not one. Romans 5, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were more, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, here's the point on your handout. We are more sinful than we think, but more loved than we ever imagined. You and I are more sinful than we think, but more loved than we ever imagined. And look at verse 11. He says, the Father in heaven loves to give good gifts to those who ask him. We just sang a song about that in church. We just talked about every good gift that comes out of James 1, 17, comes from you. And then in verse 12, we're going to come to a verse that almost everybody has heard. And if you hadn't heard of this verse... You've heard of the golden rule. You know the golden rule, right? It's found in Matthew 7, verse 12. If I was to say to you, can you quote the golden rule? Most of us would misquote it. You say, wait a second, Pastor Kevin, I, I've been a Christian longer than you've been alive. What do you mean I would misquote the golden rule? Because I dare say most of us would start with do. Well, you know, the golden rule, right? Do to others as you'd have them do to you. That's not what the verse starts with. Look at the Bible. The verse says, therefore, or so in everything. See, I saw something this week that many of us have forgotten. Many of us have forgotten, see, there is a connection between prayer and the golden rule. Context is important as I rightly handle the truth. The key is to understand how the golden rule fits in the passage. Context, context, context. The entire passage is about a true believer and how a true believer is to be different because normal wasn't working. So we need a new normal. What is he saying? Number one, the only way to keep the golden rule is through prayer. I can't keep the golden rule without continually asking, seeking, and knocking. And number two, the golden rule is a summary of the Old Testament. Look what he says verse 12. This sums up the law. What's that? The first five books of the Old Testament. And the prophets. What that? Well, that's the rest of the Old Testament. You know, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Now, this is very important. Number three, the golden rule is not for unbelievers. The entire passage is about Christians. He says, brothers, there is nothing in this principle, the golden rule, that can save anyone. Ephesians makes it clear. I'm saved by grace through faith, not by works. Well, I'm just trying to keep the golden rule. You ever heard anybody say that? Well, I'm just trying to keep the golden rule. Well, two things. Number one, you can't do it. Number two, even if you could do it, that alone will not get you into heaven. Even if you could actually keep the golden rule, which you can't do anyway, but even if you could, if anything, it might prevent you from getting into heaven because it might cause you to think that you are good enough and there's none righteous. No, not right. One, a true believer thinks differently. A true believer prays differently. And then he will say, 
number three, a true believer lives differently. And he makes it very clear in verses 13 and 14, A, there are only two ways, two gates, two destinations, and two types of people in the world. Enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, many enter through it. Small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The broad road leads to destruction, leads to hell. The narrow road leads to life, it leads to heaven, and only a few find it. What's that mean? B, there will be far less people in heaven than we think. So to illustrate this, I know you've been wondering why I have this funnel and why I've had my funnel on this table the entire time. What Jesus is talking about is the normal way someone uses a funnel is this way, right? You pour something into the broad way and it narrows it down into the funnel. That's what Jesus said. But Jesus said the entire point of the passage is normal wasn't working. So I want you to have a new normal. If you had to summarize the entire Sermon on the Mount, one word, different. I want you to be different. I want you to try a new normal. Why? Narrow is the way and only a few find it. And when we, and there, when we enter through the narrow way, an amazing thing happens. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I've come that you might have life. And life to the full, life more abundantly. When I enter through the way of Jesus, life is more abundant. Life is more fun. Life is better with Jesus. That's what he's teaching. A true believer lives differently. A true believer prays differently. And a true believer thinks differently. Jesus is calling us to be different. Think about it. Most of Jesus' teachings, completely different. Think about what Jesus taught. If you want to be first, you need to be last. When you give, it will be given to you. What? If someone hurts you, bless them. Totally opposite of what we think. Jesus says, get on the narrow road, but the majority of people travel on the broad road. The majority of people don't want to be different. The majority of people find comfort in doing what everybody else is doing, going where everyone else is going, living how everybody else is going. The majority of people don't want to be different. They want to be normal, but normal wasn't working. So we need a new normal. Think about it in your schedule. Normal wasn't working. Thinking about it in your finances, in your relationships, in your spirituality. If you're living like everyone else, Jesus says you're on the broad road. And I want to say this as kindly as I can. If you're living like everyone else and you're doing what everybody else is doing and thinking like everyone else, if you're pretty normal, you're on the broad road you will probably end up in hell one day. So here's the question. Number one, which road are you on? Because we're all on a road. We've all got a journey in life. Which one are you on? As we wrap up this series, Reopening, let me ask you number two, have you ever opened your heart, your mind, your life. Why? Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. When you leave the normal road and get on the narrow road, people will think you're different. Your life will not be like everyone else's. You will think differently. You will pray differently. And you, as a real true believer will actually live differently. You will behave differently. See, here's the truth. Number three, most people 
most believers are living such subnormal Christian lives that when someone lives a Christian life, people think they're abnormal. Most believers are living such subnormal Christian lives, below normal Christian life, not the kind of life that Jesus outlined for us in his most famous sermon, that when actually someone comes and thinks differently and actually has a biblical worldview and interprets the details of today, whatever generation they're in through the lens of Scripture, when they really understand what a biblical worldview is, it affects our thinking, and when you do that, people think you are abnormal. A real, true believer prays differently because they keep on asking, they keep on seeking, they keep on knocking, they have a confidence when they pray. They understand that I'm more sinful than I imagined, but I'm more loved than I ever dreamed. And I understand that there's a confidence that I, because of the blood of Jesus, can enter the most holy place because he is the way maker. He has made a way. He has won. Death has been defeated. Satan has been conquered. You see, have you ever personalized that for you? Or are you just going through life trying to live a normal life? Normal is not working, and it was not working back in February. And deep down, you know it. Deep down, you know it. So we need a new normal. We need to think differently, pray differently, and live differently. Would you bow with me? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for anyone under the sound of my voice right now that you would help them to have a new normal. Pastor Jeff is going to come at this time and close our service up at the Highlands campus. For those of you that are watching today or those of you that are live here at the Fincastle campus, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, today is your day. We talked about what is the gospel have you ever truly accepted the gospel? Just right where you are, maybe that needs to be you today. And say, God, I finally get it. You love me. I admit that I've sinned. I understand there's the result of my sin is death in hell. But you came. Jesus died. He was buried and he rose for me. And I confess that. I believe that now. And I'm asking you to make me a Christian. Listen, if that's you today and you're watching me on the online platform, you just click that button. You virtually raise a hand indicating your decision. If you're on Facebook Live, you direct message us. We'd love to respond to you. If you're here in the service today, after the service, I'll be standing outside. I'd love to greet you and be able to help you. You know, many of us would say, I remember a time I made a commitment to Jesus, and let me ask you, have you been living like everybody else? Normal? Normal wasn't working. We need a new normal. Think differently. When you see the division and the destruction and the dysfunction of our society and our government and the political process. Have a biblical worldview. Pray differently. And live differently. And maybe you're here today and you admit you have been just swept up with normal. Jesus is calling us to be different. Jesus is calling us to a higher standard. Jesus is calling you and I to think differently, to pray differently, to live differently. God, help us to do it. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided a way that you are the way maker. In Jesus' name, amen.